I want us once again to establish the reality of the gospel because it's so important to do. Um, and you know, I, I kind of started last week uh, just talking about just concepts of growth, and um, you know, because we all, you know, when we when we first get born again and we're made, you know, right with God through what Jesus has done. Um, that, that is a completed work. Um, you can't add to that. You can't take away from that. That's something that's done by the hands of God. And um, your, your rightness with God is, is in your spirit. It's based upon what Jesus has done. But then how many know that, that God also wants for there to be growth and development in our lives? Amen? Because we all we want to uh, have the fruit of the character of Jesus. We want to walk like Jesus. We want to treat each other well. We want to walk in love. We want to have peace. We want to have joy. All these types of things. And development requires um, the ability to be wrong. Does everybody know that? You don't grow until you're ready to be wrong. Because, um, because the way that God brings forth growth in our lives is he, it's through truth, right? And truth is going to bring greater and greater levels of freedom. And so what we, what we do is we take the Scriptures, uh, we, the presence of God is here, and the Holy Spirit is the teacher, and then we, we begin to renew our minds to the truth of who we are and who God is. And as we do that, and we do it continually, what happens is our lives start to change. You know, I've been set free from drug addiction, alcoholism, been set free from, you know, pornography, lying, cheating, stealing, all the crazy stuff. Uh, being set free from sugar, can I get an amen? <laughs> Hallelujah, that's still happening. Hallelujah. Uh, have, have had good moments and bad moments. And, uh, but uh, freedom is, it's an ever-increasing thing, right? And the cool thing about having a relationship with the one that does not change is that as you're in a place of relationship with Him, He's going to bring forth change in your life. Now here's the thing. God's not changing you to make you more likable or lovable. You have to understand that. God, God loves you just the way you are. And all those areas of your life that are not quite flowing in the image of Jesus, are, are God knows why you're like that. I mean, you know, the re reason a lot of people... Um, or have certain behavioral things that they do, or certain cycles of mistakes or whatever, a lot, I mean, a lot of those things comes from wounding. It comes from being wounded, uh, either in your childhood or, or different time in your life or whatever. This world is a rough place. And so God, He loves you just the way you are, right? I mean, I love my kids whether their hands are clean or dirty. You know, I love my daughter whether she's got a poopy diaper or a clean diaper, you know? Amen. My love for her is not based on anything that she can do. My love for her is based upon who she is. And you have to understand that God feels the same way about you. God loves you just the way you are. <clears throat> God doesn't love someone in this room more than somebody else. Okay? There's nobody in this room that's any better than anybody else. Can I get an amen? Those things are very important to say regularly because we can build this, this mindset of comparison and you're really not called to compare yourself to anybody else because there's nobody like you. If you have a thumbprint, there's only one thumbprint that's like yours in all the history of humanity, how much more unique is your born-again spirit, right? And so there's a uniqueness in your life. How many of you are running your own race? Can I get an amen? You're not running against somebody else, and the fruit that comes on your tree is going to be unique to you, your personalities, your gifts, and all these types of things. And so it's very important that you don't compare yourself with somebody else. It's very important that you don't judge your worth um, based upon somebody else or you know, what they have or what you have or any of those things. What's up, Josiah? Good to see you, man. Come on in. Um, uh, it's very important to understand that. And, and so, so you're, God's not changing you so that He can love you more. God's not changing you to make you more right with Him. Okay? That initial change in the born-again experience when your spirit becomes alive, that change is final. The same righteousness that you receive when you're first saved is the same righteousness that you're going to take on into eternity with God. So these things are settled, right? And how many know that's good news, right? 
You know, heaven, heaven, your, your, your life is not, you know, a series of decisions that are heaven and hell based, right? Once you're born again, man, you're a child of God, you're the righteousness of God. But God does want to grow, to bring forth growth and development in you um, for a couple different reasons. Number one is it actually glorifies His Son. I mean, you know, when people see Jesus in us, it glorifies Him. Just like uh, Trey was sharing, to protrude or to be different. You know, when you carry yourself the way Jesus carries Himself, and you actually care about people and love people and you have peace and joy, how many of you are different? You know, and you should be, right? Uh, it, 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 it shouldn't take a Christian t-shirt to, to let people know you're a believer. There should be something about your life that's different. And, and so there is, there's a fruit that comes out of you that actually glorifies the Lord. He is the vine dresser. Uh, we are the branches. We're connected to the vine. But here's the next thing about development in your life is it's actually going to make your life better. And that's always a greater motive. <laughs> Shouldn't be, but it is because we're human, right? I mean, who wants to be happy? Who wants to have a good life, right? Who wants to have a healthy marriage and, and, and healthy children and healthy finances, healthy uh, emotional well-being, all these types of things. And everything that God has planned in your life. See, God's not calling you to suffer to make you more holy or more righteous. There is an element of suffering that's in this life, but it's primarily persecution. Okay? Uh, there are challenges. We live in a fallen world and all these types of things. But God... See, people should be drawn to you based purely upon the quality of your life. And I'm not talking about everything being perfect, but I'm talking about you having peace and joy in the midst of the storm because you're connected to something greater than you. Exactly what Trey w w was sharing just a moment ago. We're to be different, man. And, 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 and that peace and that joy and that love that we have should draw people to us so that we can point them to Jesus. Can I get an amen? You know? And, and, um, and so they can have their own relationship with the Lord. And so, growth and development, it's going to glorify the Lord. Um, it's going to make your life better, right? I never want to get to the place where I think I got it all figured out. See, the moment that you think it all, you got it all figured out and you know everything, you're no longer a student and you've stopped growing. And the challenge is what's going to happen to you is something's going to develop in your life called pride. And pride is the one thing that frustrates grace. You never want to think that you've got this thing figured out. I mean, you know, nobody on earth got God figured out. Okay, get an amen. I want to stay a student. I've been a student in this thing for over 20 years. I'm still learning, and I always want to be learning, right? And so there is growth that God wants to bring in your life. And a lot of times, people are looking for a miracle. And nothing wrong with miracles. Nothing wrong with powerful things happening on the outside of you. But one of the things that God wants to do in you is He wants to change your heart. And a lot of times, there are things that we're looking for externally to change when God is looking to change some things internally. And when those things change internally, there will be things that will change externally. Because here's the reality. You are not called to control another human being. Ever. It is not your job to change anybody. It will never be your job to change anybody. Now, when you're a parent... You, you ha you, there is some element of jurisdiction that you have over your children. You teach them right from wrong. You have an element of control over their lives, and you should because you're teaching them how to steward liberty, right? But you do not control your spouse. You do not control anybody in here, and you don't control anybody out there. And, if you th and, and a lot of our problems arise out of the th fact that we think it's our job to control people because we think it's for their own good. If you're trying to control someone, it's called manipulation, which the Scripture says is witchcraft. And how I many of there's a lot of different ways you control people? You control people with anger. You can control people through pouting, through emotional type of stuff. Um, you can try to you can control try to control people through charm. You can try to control people. You can try to be in control because the human heart, if if the love of God is not present in the human heart, then most people are operating in a, in a degree of low grade fear at all times. And so when someone's afraid, they're looking to be in control so they're not hurt. 
and it's no way to live. And, and what happens is God actually has called you to not try to control anybody else, but the one thing that you do have jurisdiction over is yourself. And you can choose to allow the truth to come into your life, to change the way you think, to change what you believe, so that you can grow and you can develop, and then ultimately it brings you into a place of love. That's actually what God's called you to do. He's called you to be loved by Him, number one, and then He's called you to love Him. I mean, we had, we had some real joyous time loving on the Lord in here today. Wasn't it beautiful, right? And, and it feels so good when, when it happens, you know? And it's out of a heart place. But then the next thing is He wants you to love the people around you. And then He also wants you to love the, your enemies. <laughs> You're not called to just love people that you like or called to love people that think like you. Because here's the thing. When love is present, God is getting the most things done in someone else's life. Because when you stop trying to control people and stop trying to be God over somebody's life, then God can be God. So your job is to treat people the way you want to be treated. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Right? Now it's supernatural and it's impossible, but you can do it through the power of God's grace and His Spirit. Amen? <clears throat> and so, and all the growth that we have is to bring us into a place where love is flowing through us. And out of that, all the good things happen. Out of that, sin doesn't have dominion over your life. Fear doesn't have dominion over your life. Out of that, all good things, right? And so, there is an element of growth. There's an element of development in our lives. If you want to have it. Now, you don't have to. How many of you know there are whole swaths of the body of Christ that have zero desire to actually have growth and development. They just want to make sure they're going to heaven when they die. And how many of y'all, that's okay. Like, I'm not going to judge those people or anything like that. I mean, that's fine. It's, you know, <clears throat> if that's all you want. But, but I want more than that. And, and, uh, and I want more than that, not, not only because I want more than that, because I actually need more than that. You know, I came, came from a background where I was so messed up. If I didn't have some change in my life, then my life would be hell on earth. And so growth and development is actually, it's what me being a disciple actually is. We are looking to walk the way He walked. Okay, get an amen. And, and so, and that takes time, and it takes, you know, applying yourself, it takes relationship, all these types of things. And so, but in order for that to happen, without someone getting under condemnation, it's important to establish the reality of the gospel so that, because this is what happens a lot of times, okay? You'll, you're, there you are, and God's got a, 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 a light on an area of your life that needs growth. How many of you know God doesn't correct everything in you all at once? Can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, no, no, no. No, God will like, okay, here, this right here, this doesn't look like me, so I'm going to need you to, to, to decide to humble yourself and allow me to show you who you are in an area that you think that you're somebody you're not. How many of you know you are not an angry person? Can I get an amen? How many of you know you are not a lustful person? Can I get an amen? How many of you know you're not a liar? You're not a thief? You're not all of these things. Why? Because you are now in Christ Jesus. And so what's happened is God has given you a new nature through the born-again experience but that new nature is not automatically deposited into your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And the reason we read the Scriptures, the reason we come to church, is to change the way we think concerning who we are and who God is. And as you start to see yourself in Christ and start to allow that to happen, there's a transformation and there's a metamorphosis that happens in your life. And it's awesome. And every time... There is an area of your life where, re where repentance happens. And that word repentance is the word metanoia. It means to change your mind. How many know you need to change your mind about some things? Yeah. About you. How many know you have value? You have worth. There's nobody that's any better than you. Can I get an amen? Those are some major places of change that a lot of times people need because we've all been beat down so bad. And so God is going to systematically 
bring change into your life to bring growth. If you want it, He will never force you. Can I get an amen? Because see, here's the cool thing about God. God Himself won't control you. He doesn't. You have free will. He, you, you've always been given free will. You can eat the tree of life. You can eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat so much pork you feel sick today. Or you can not. <laughs> he will not control you. But what He will do is He will love you to the place that He's hoping you continue to choose life. Over and over again. Because the more you trust Him and believe Him, you will believe that the way that He wants to do things is the way that works best. And as you decide to do things the way He wants to do things, your life is just going to get better and better. Because He's the one that designed everything. So He knows how things operate. Amen? And so, He'll not force you to do anything. Now, He will help you to choose life and all these things. But even then, see, if I force you to do something, it doesn't mean anything. If I make you hug me, it doesn't mean anything. How many of that's a worthless hug? But if you choose to hug me, <laughs> Mickey's smiling because first six months he went to church here, I made him hug me on the regular. He, he's, not, he's not used to men hugging other men. This is a new thing for him. He's like, you shake my hand and that's cool. And now i got to pry him off of me, man. It's like, all right, bro, we're good, man. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding, man. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Hallelujah. Thank, praise God. Don't make me turn Drew loose on you because Drew will set you free, brother. <laughs> A man of many hugs. <laughs> Amen. But if someone chooses to hug you, it means something. And it's the same way with our love to God. And it's also the same thing with our trust that God knows the best way to do things. Amen. And so, it's a beautiful thing, and, um, and we choose. But what I have found, that the more areas of our life that we can line up with His will, the better our life is. The happier we are, the better things function, the more we protrude. <laughs> the more we stick out, the more we're different, right? Because how many of you know the world does not do things the way God does things, Right? So, I want to take just a quick moment, and I want to establish the gospel here. And what's cool is we have food, so you guys don't have to be afraid, amen, concerning how long we're here. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, um, this is um, talking about Jesus. It says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So, Jesus on the cross became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. When you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you become right with God. You stay right with God because your rightness with God is the product of having a new nature. Okay, So your growth and development has nothing to do with your rightness with God. I'm going to say it a couple times. Your growth and development has nothing to do with your rightness with God. Your growth and development has nothing to do with your rightness with God. I mean, when my children are learning to walk, they're my children when they're walking well and when they're falling. They're still my children. And people have presented growth in a format that made people think that they weren't right with God if they did the wrong thing. And that's dangerous because that means that you think God's, your relationship with God is something that you can earn with your good behavior. And what that does is that puts you in control of the goodness of God according to your conduct. And that is dangerous. And it's actually anti-Christ. <clears throat> God doesn't want you to be in control of His goodness. God wants you to be good to you because He loves you, not because you've earned it or deserved it. Can I get an amen? Because God's not after the forced obedience of your hand. God's actually after the wooing of your heart. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He's looking to cause us to fall in love with Him out of the place of His goodness and His kindness. So God wants you to grow and develop, 
But God does not want your growth and development to be what makes you think that you're right with God. I'm just as right with God right now as I was the moment that I got born again at 19 years old when I was still a drug addict. Now my life looks different 20 plus years later, but my rightness with God has stayed the same because my rightness with God is a person and not a behavior. Everybody tracking me here. It's really important. I just nail this thing down. You've got to hear this regularly so that you know. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 it says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, your conduct cannot make you right with God. Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the end of conduct for right standing with God. How many of the thief on the cross became right with God because he believed? Not because he went to church. Not because he did a good de th deed. It's because he believed. Everybody tracking me here? Amen. Um. And then uh, we'll do Galatians chapter 2. It says, verse 16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified or declared right by the works of the law or by deeds of conduct, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, we might be justified by faith in Christ, by believing in Jesus. Not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Listen, you cannot do enough right things to get to heaven. You cannot do enough right things to make you right with God. If you could do enough right things to make you right with God, there is absolutely no reason for Jesus to die. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for people who were not doing the right thing. God loves sinners. God loves the people that are not doing the right thing. Right? And what He does is He takes you and He pulls you into Himself. And then you become one with Christ. And then you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But now His intention is that that seed of the incorruptible Word of God that's been sown on the inside of you and caused you to be born again, He wants that nature that's been placed in you to start to, to come on the outside of you. So that your action and your behavior lines up with the character and the nature that is already on the inside of you. How I many of oh, God is a farmer? Jesus was the seed, right? Amen. And so, and then I'll just one more place. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. <clears throat> it says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, which is according to my conduct, according to the things that I do, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection. Let me just stop here for a moment and say this. It's going to be difficult for you to have a relationship with God if you don't know that you're right with God. And if you think that your rightness with God is based upon you and your conduct, you'll always be in doubt concerning about the way God feels about you. And the enemy will be able to kick your butt. Because he'll always point you to you. Because how many of there's always one thing you lack? And then another thing, and then another thing, and another thing. I mean, you, know, you don't look to you to see perfection. You look to Jesus to see perfection. In Jesus is perfection. Right? And as you see Him and behold Him, you are transformed from glory to glory. Change happens through beholding Jesus, through beholding yourself in Jesus. And when there are parts of you that are not lined up, with who you are in Christ Jesus, it's in that place that you have not awakened to righteousness yet in that place. See, I still struggle with drug addiction after I was saved. It took me time to get free. I got off the harder stuff first, and then eventually all the other stuff would get off. And then I had other areas of my life that I struggled in for years. right? And, but you know what? God set me free from all of those things. And so, you may have some areas of your life where you know who you are in Christ, but there may be some other areas of your life where you don't yet. And that's why you come to church. That's why you hear the Word of God. That's why you become a disciple. So God can iron out those places in you that you don't know who you are yet. Because you are called to look like Jesus through, through your personality. Can I get an amen? You don't want somebody else's personality. We don't need you to be somebody else, okay? We already have that person. We need you to be you. Can you get an amen? amen? So important, man. We want to celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ. We want to celebrate the different giftings. Never pattern yourself after another human being. No. We want Jesus shining out of you. 
Because Jesus shining out of you is the beauty that you bring to the body of Christ. And you are awesome. Amen. It's true. And so, you are the righteousness of God. Now, let's turn to John 15, please. And, and once again, it's difficult to enjoy relationship with someone that you don't think you're right with. And it's a challenge because you can't see the face of God right now. Right? We walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, you can see somebody's face and tell if they're pleased with you or not. I can look at my wife and know if she's mad at me. She's got to say nothing. I'm like, oh man. Right? And how many know, and all the women was like, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and here's the thing. No one wants to spend time around someone who's mad at them. No one wants to spend time around someone who's disappointed in them. I'm taking it a step further. These are dangerous waters. We had a men's prayer breakfast yesterday, so I'm feeling pretty bold. You know what I'm saying? I got a belly full of sausage. I'm like, all right, guys, y'all ready? They're like, we're going to bury you with that shovel in the back. <laughs> no, I'm just no one wants to be around someone who nags them all the time. Okay? Selah, Selah. Dan's pretty bold back there, ain't he? Like, that's right. Dan can say that because Dan ain't married. <laughs> Dan's like, I ain't scared of nobody. I came in here and I'm leaving. You know, it's like, amen, amen. You got my back, right, Dan? You got my back. Hallelujah. Just kidding. But what you have to understand is that while you are growing, God still loves you and is well pleased with you and sees who you truly are as you make the mistakes that you make. God sees your potential. God knows why you make the mistakes that you make. And He's committed to you to bring forth fruit in your life. I mean, what God started in you, God's going to finish. Can you get an amen? amen? We can't do this in our own strength. But the one thing we can do is we can show up for relationships. And that's where abide comes in. That word abide. We're talking about abiding in the vine. That word's the word, it's the word mino. And it means to stay, to make your home, to be present. How I many you know that when you make a decision to come to the Lord in a place of relationship, there's going to be continual change in your life? If you're doing it from the heart. How I many you know in, in, in man made religion, how I many you know man made religion is heartless? How I many you know you can go through the motions of relationship in man-made religion and not be engaged in your heart? You can sing the words, you can lift your hand, you can drop your tithe in the bucket, you can come to church, you can do all of these things, but you're just going through the motions of what you know is right rather than making a heart-to-heart -heart contact. How I many of you can do that in any of your relationships? But the power of relationship is heart-to-heart -heart contact with God and with people. And that word abide is, 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 is a relational term and it means showing up in a place of relationship because what you want, you don't want to form, you want to have a heart-to-heart -heart with God. Just like in our service today, like I don't know what's going to happen. I kind of think I know what's going to happen, but I want to make room for something to happen that I didn't expect. Everybody tracking me here? Because the, because the service is alive if we let it. And the Spirit of God is here. And who knows what God wants to do? You know? And we've had times when we, you know, then we just sang the whole service. You know, and we've had time, we've, you know, different times have been different things. But how many know you can turn anything into a formula and into religion? What we want to do is we want to hear and feel what is God wanting to do? Right? How many know that's relationship? And that's exciting, and that's where wonderful things happen, right? Amen. And so, this, this word here, it says abide. You know, Mark, uh, John 15 and verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So, when you spend time with the Lord, you draw strength from the Lord. You know? And, you know, I've been in a season in my life where I have so many different things going on. I have a lot of challenges going on. And I need time with the Lord. Never get to a place where you're too busy to spend time with God. If you're too busy to spend time with God, you're too busy. Because the, the thing I... See, well, I got this, I got that, I got that. 
You don't want to spend your life running around putting out small fires. How many know when the edge of the axe is sharp, it requires less effort? And your time with God is what makes you sharp. And if you'll prioritize your time with God, your marriage will run smoother, raising your children will run smoother, your finances will run smoother, the health of your body, everything will be smoother because you'll be in a place of being sharp and in a place of relationship with the Lord. Can I get an amen to that? You know, and, and, and I can't function on my strength because my strength is not enough. If, I, if I'm on empty and I'm not strong in relationship, I start to not look like Jesus. <laughs> Can I get an amen for cranky, grumpy, you know, spirit of butthead falling upon you? You know what I'm saying? And rah! You know, all I got's the bumper sticker and the t-shirt, you know? And, and how many know that can happen to any of us if we start to set aside relationship? How many know the enemy will try to distract you away from personal relationship with the Lord? How many know sometimes you've got to put your phone on the other side of the room? You got you got to take you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to guard some time with the Lord. Amen. Now here's the thing. How many you know whether you spend time with the Lord or not, you're still right with God if you're born again. And whether you spend time with the Lord or not, God still loves you. Can you get an amen? But I don't want to be a branch that's getting its butt kicked in the sun rather than being connected to the vine and bringing forth fruit. It's just better, right? And so And then he goes on, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, man, read the scriptures, I'm telling you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. You're going to be different. You're going to walk different. Now, this is really where I want to get to, and this is super interesting. I've been studying this for the past couple months. I, still been, I, just, I am obsessed with this right now, and uh, it's super exciting. So, now, all right, let's look at this next verse. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Now, abide in my love. I'm talking about abiding in love. Now, Abiding in love is you're making love your home. You're making love the place where you dwell. You're making love the place where you live. You're abiding in love. You're staying in love. Now here's the thing. He loves you whether you're abiding in the love or not. This is important. He loves you whether you're abiding in the love or not. He loves you whether you're abiding in the love or not. Let me give you an example. Last night, we were having dinner, uh, and we were finishing up, and I gave my dog some scraps from the table. My dog was eating the scraps. <clears throat> my daughter came over and wanted to get right in my dog's face while he's eating the scraps, right? How many of y'all, that's not smart. <clears throat> and so I heard the dog growl. Now, the dog's never bit anybody. Or anything, but he growled, and so the dog's communicating to her, you know, I love you, but I need you to scoot back, right? And so I have to raise my voice to my daughter, which I never do. And I said, Lily. I, and, and so, and I, you know, because I was concerned that she was going to be hurt, right? So I don't raise my voice to my daughter. So she was shocked. And so, and very upset. And so she was crying and she was upset. And so I am, and so now I'm concerned because how many know the heart of a child is fragile? And it's not just your intention, it's their perception of your intention. And children are very, very impressionable and very malleable. So I've got some serious parenting to do right now. Because I don't, I don't just want to keep her safe. I want her to know the reason I spoke so strongly to her is how much I love her. So I'm trying to hold her, I'm trying to hug her, and she is fighting me, man. I mean, I'm talking like just kicking and screaming and shouting. She does not want anything to do with me. And so, you know, and so, but I'm, but I'm going to persist here. Now I'm going to let her go because I, if I just fight her, she'll just fight me back. And, uh, and so, but then her mom, Stacey gets a hold of her and picks her up. And I'm trying to explain to her what's going on. And, 
explain to her, this is why I said this, this is why I did this, this is why I said this. Why. Now, how many know I love her the whole time, start to finish? But I'm trying to bring her back into a place of abiding in the reality of my love. She thinks I'm mad at her or she's done something wrong. How many know I'm only trying to protect her? So eventually, over the course of time, through a couple different times, I finally got her to understand that this is why I did this, because I love you. So I brought her back into the place of binding my love, and then I had both of them under the blanket, we were all cuddling together, and they were back. So I loved her the whole time, but she had a portion of that time where she thought that I was mad at her, disappointed in her. How many know that God has loved you the whole time? But there may have been some time where you thought that he, was, that he was mad at you or disappointed in you, and God's been trying to get you to abide in His love. Because when you abide in His love, great things happen. And see, He loved you before you loved Him. He loved you before you called on the name of, the, of Jesus. He's always loved you. And He always will love you. But He's trying to get you to abide. And so I talked her back into abiding in my love. And it was important to me because it doesn't matter how much you love somebody, if they don't believe it, they're not going to enjoy it or experience it. That's a big part of the reason you come to church. Because you need a fresh I love you from God. Because you live in a world that don't love you. And so, he says, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved in you. Abide in my love. Now, let me ask you a question before we move on to the next one. Do you think God's love for Jesus, Father God's love for Jesus, do you think that it, it ever fluctuated or changed? No, of course not. I mean, that's a ridiculous concept. Monday morning, God loves Jesus this much. Tuesday this much. Wednesday this much. How I many know oh, God loves His Son Jesus? Can I get an amen? So there's no fluctuation in God's love towards Jesus. Can we all establish that reality? Well, let's read this next verse with that understanding. He says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. How many know Jesus didn't have to do what God told Him to do in order to be loved by God? I mean, we already established that, right? God's love for Jesus does not fluctuate. Right? But, there is a place in abiding in love that requires us to trust God enough to do what He's asked us to do. And get, let me, let me, let me, Let's just move forward a little bit and we'll, we'll dive back into that passage. And he goes on, so he says, he says that, he says, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment. This is the commandment of Jesus Christ. Are you all ready? That you love one another as I have loved you. That is what God's asking you to do. Everybody tracking me here? How many know that you loving your neighbor is not what makes you right with God? Important to hit this real good here. You loving your neighbor is not what makes you right with God. How many of you are right with God because you believe in Jesus Christ? God's command is to believe and to love. The first thing you've got to do is believe. Believing is the most important thing because believing is what brings everything else into you. What do you believe? You believe in Jesus. You believe the cross is a success, right? And you actually believe that God loves you. But the next thing is God wants that love that comes to you to go through you so that you can abide in love. Let me read this to you out of the Weiss translation. If you don't have a Weiss translation, get one. Kenneth Weiss was a Greek scholar. Amazing. Amazing stuff. And what it does, it does not water down any of the verbiage in order to convey what's being said in the Greek. Let me read this to you in the Weiss. John 15, verse 9. It says, Just as the Father loved me, I also loved you. Remain within the sphere of the love which is mine. God's calling you to abide and to live in love. Love to you and love through you is how you stay in that love. See, the love is always coming to you. 
but it's not always going through you. And when it's not going through you, you don't have the benefits of abiding in love. There's benefits to abiding in love. One of those benefits is you become fearless. Because perfect love drives out fear. Oh gosh, do you want that? I want it. I want to have a life where fear does not have any control over me whatsoever. Another thing that happens to you when you abide in love, your joy is full. Another thing that happens to you when you abide in love, your faith is energized and strong. I mean, faith works by love. Faith is energized by love. <clears throat> See, we've all been trying to hit side dishes when we just need to hit the main dish. If you'll hit the main dish, the side dishes will be taken care of. Everybody trying to have peace, trying to have joy, trying to have faith, trying to do all that? No. Just believe the cross is a success. Believe that you're the righteousness of God. Believe that your sin is forgiven. Your sins and lawless deeds you will remember no more. Believe that Jesus did a good job when you're right with God. And then take that love that's coming to you and let it flow through you to everybody. Everybody say everybody. everybody. You know, everybody. Not just the people that are Christians. Not just the people that you agree with. Because God's going to get more done <clears throat> through your love than your anger. You know how we change the world? We don't change the world by convincing them that we're right. We change them by treating them better than anyone's ever treated them before. It's what works. It's what Jesus did. And so, so it says, Remain within the sphere of the love which is mine. If my commandments you keep, you will remain within the sphere of my love, just as I have kept my, father, my commandments of my Father, and I'm remaining in the sphere of His love. Okay. Can we get that first um, graphic up on the screen, please? Okay. Yes, I know it's a wonder to behold. I created this myself. I'm considering going into some graphic design. Not really. However, the simplicity of the image, this is love to you. This has been a reality in your life your, the entirety of your existence and before your existence, God has loved you. And He's always been drawing on you with His love, right? He doesn't love you more now that you're saved, but He's happy that you're going to live forever. He's happy that He can be a father to you, right? And so this is, this is constant. But in the next frame, please. In order for the next thing to happen, there's got to be some decisions that you make. And there's got to be a decision. See, this is abiding in love. This is being surrounded by love. This is love to you, and this is love through you. This is where fear is not in control of your life. This is where you are treating people the way you want to be treated. Now, I don't think this is something you arrive at and click in and stay. I think we fluctuate between the two. Anybody have times in your life where you're walking in love and times where you're not? Me, I, me. Like, I, and what I'll find out is, you know, I'll try to figure out why, like, I'm not happy and I'm frustrated and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And then I'll go do something like an outreach or something and I'll minister to like homeless people or people that can't help me and I'll let and love will flow through me and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot to love people. <laughs> And that's why I'm not happy. And then I get back into it again, and then, you know, I fluctuate it. But my intention is to stay there. Can I get an amen? How many you know, in order for you to, to do the commandment of the Lord, which is to love people the way that He's loved you, how many of you know it's going to change the way you do life? It's going to change the focus of your life from yourself to other people. It's, right, it's a pretty radical way to live. But it actually makes life really exciting. Because when you go to the market, when you go to Kroger or Walmart or whatever, you're looking for someone to treat well. You're looking for someone to be kind to. And what happens is, even when we fellowship today, let's, let's have an experiment. When we fellowship today, endeavor to treat everybody you see in here as if they were you. How would you want to treat them if they were you? And so when you talk to them, treat them as if they were you. When you eat around them, treat them as if they were you. You know what's going to happen to you? You're not going to be self-conscious. 
you're going you're gonna to become you know, less fearful and socially awkward and thinking about yourself and all these things because you're not going to be the number one thing in your focus. Because what, what, what happens is, as human beings, we're paralyzed by this sense of self-focus. I always think about myself. Well, what, do I, what if I say something stupid? You know, what if, what if my fly's down? You know, what if I got salad in my teeth? What if I eat too much pork? You know, what if I, what if I, what if I, what if I? You see, the reality is, is no one in this room is as focused on you as you are. We are all, in the natural realm, painfully self-focused. And it's why people aren't happy. Because if you want to be happy, you have to recognize you're a part of something bigger than you. You're a part of the body of Christ. And man, if we can start to do church right, the Bible says they will know us by our love for each other. If we can actually, really, not just theoretically, but actually begin to treat each other the way we want to be treated, then why wouldn't you want to be around a group of people that's going to treat you the way they want to be treated? You would run to get to church. Because you want to be around people that love you and care for you. Can I get an amen? And we don't want it just in the church. We want it in our homes and in our marriages and in our, with our children so that when we're out in the public, can we keep that, uh, that sphere up there? When we're out in the public, I'm carrying something that is powerful. Everybody tracking me here? Yeah. And, and like this is not just a theoretical thing. This is not just a concept. This is not just a knowledge. <clears throat> if we can get this on a heart level, then your life becomes really exciting. And this is what happens. You start to have joy. And you're not scared of anything. Because you're not thinking about yourself. It's amazing. It's just so cool. So now, like when I'm out, and what else also helps is when somebody does you wrong, you treat them the way you would want to be treated. Not the way they treated you. This is really important. See, the love walk is not reactive. See, if somebody can make you mad and offend you, they control you. If someone can offend you and make you mad, understand you, you are not as free as you want to be. Be, but, but what I'm talking about, and, and see, it's not an automatic thing, clearly. I mean, this is going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take a decision to decide to follow the commandment of Jesus Christ. And you're not doing this to be right with God. You're not doing this to be loved by God. You're actually doing this to create a quality of life greater than anything you've ever known. I've been practicing this in my marriage here lately. And... My marriage is better than it's ever been in my entire life. I am choosing to love my wife and to treat her the way I want to be treated. And here's the thing. And it, it gets easier as you develop it into a habit and a way of life. And really, it's just a perception. Because when I get up in the morning, like, with, like for example, with my kids, like let's say Eli or something like that, it's like they want to play. I'm tired. But they want to play. Now, if I were six years old, how would I want my dad to treat me? Yeah, would I want... And see, and once you step over into living for something other than yourself, there's an energy that comes on you and a strength that comes on you. Next thing you know, there you are with your kid having a great time because you're, you're choosing to do what Jesus asked you to do. And... It's, it's, and, and then when it's, and another thing, and we're, we're closing, we're wrapping up here, and we're going to finish on this point, we're not going to go any deeper, but everything becomes ministry. Everything. See, this is 1% of ministry. See, ministry is serving people in love. When I get food for my family, ministry. You know, when I help my son find something, Ministry. Feeding my dog. Come on, Dan. Praise God. 
Hit me with it, bro. Hit me with it. Amen. Hallelujah. It's true. So it's true. Yes. Amen. I'm getting. I'm doing better. Doing better. I'm, righteous man regards the life of his beast. Me and my dog are no longer at odds. We're now friends. So it's cool. If he messes stuff up, I just forgive him, and Jesus loves him, and I do too. I have grown tremendously. Those of you who might not know, my dog used to really make my life hell, but it, we, we've come a long way. And uh, yeah, amen. You're right. You're right. Amen. Um, but, you know, in your life, who is that person that has the ability to control you? Who's controlling you? Who's getting you out of love? Who's robbing you of peace? Who's making you mad? Who's offending you? Because God wants to bring you to a place to where no one has control over you. You can develop this. Because what's cool, is there's a momentum to it. As you get flowing in love and caring about people, then all of a sudden you're flowing in it and you got some momentum, all of a sudden somebody will cut you off in traffic, flip you off. But you already got this momentum and so you look past the offense against you and you recognize the reason this person is doing this is they're hurting. They're stressed out. Maybe they can't pay their bills. Maybe their wife left them. Whatever. And so rather than taking it personal, you take the offenses that people bring against you and you put them on Jesus where they belong. It's the biggest deal in the world, man. You know where all the wrongs belong? On Jesus. Not on your parents, not on your friends, not on your spouse, not on your ex-spouse, not on your old church, not on your old pastor. you got to put it on Jesus. How many of you know Jesus picked up the tab for everybody's mess-ups? And what it'll do is it, 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 will, it will keep you from being offended. And it will cause forgiveness to flow out of you and you will be free. And, you, and people won't have the ability to make you angry or to make you afraid. And so, I mean, it's a different way of living, but it's funny because like, it's like right here in the book. And it's actually what God's asked us to do. And um, when we begin to walk in it, it changes everything. But this is not just a head knowledge thing. This is not just Bible facts and knowledge. This is how you live your life. Because your spirituality is not determined by your gifting or your charisma or, or how much Scripture you have memorized. Your spirituality is determined by how you treat people. And not how you treat people at church on Sunday morning for an hour and a half or whatever. How do you treat the people at your house? On your couch? That's what's up. Because man, if it's not affecting our, if it's not affecting our personal lives then we just have a show, right? Now listen, what I'm preaching, I know is, is, it's strong and it's deep, but what's awesome is, is when you don't walk in love, you're still right with God. Because who makes you right with God? Jesus does. Not your conduct and not your behavior, right? So as God teaches you how to love like He loves, when you stumble and fall... God doesn't cast you out. God still values you and loves you and is still working with you to bring forth this love that He wants flowing out of your life. Everybody tracking me here? But this is, this is the end game, man. You know, how are we going to change the world? See, now it's, it's so cool because like, I now know what to do all the time. Which I love that. I know what to do. All the time, no matter where I'm at. What are you going to do, Jeremiah? I'm going to treat people the way I want to be treated. And I'm going to be kind and I'm going to be good to everybody. And as I do it, I am so happy. <laughs> and my life is good. Now listen, I'm not up here trying to tell you all, man, I'm just Jeremiah, just walking in love all the time, never grumpy. I'm not saying that, man. I mean, I have moments of selfishness and moments of... All the, all the stuff. I'm, please understand, I'm never preaching this place from a, an arrived standpoint. But I'm preaching like I want to live here. Everybody tracking me here? And, and the benefits of it in it are astonishing, man. Love and peace and joy and kindness and goodness and, and freedom from sin, freedom from fear. 
I mean, fellowship with God. I mean, and we're going to look in this as we continue to move forward, just all the power of what is in this. I mean, it's just amazing. But, but, uh, but, I, but, but, but so let's practice today, right? For the next hour. <laughs> On the volleyball court, if we get out there and it's not too cold. Yeah, that's where I really need it, right? Everybody knows how competitive I am. <laughs> Tell you're not walking in love. You spiked in somebody's face. No, no, no. We're still trying to win. <laughs> Amen. But, yeah, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, praise God. But, but like, it, how, many know it's a de- how many know it's a decision to choose to obey the command? Of Jesus, right? But what's cool is, and, and, and what I really want to convey to you, when you do this, you're not losing, you're winning. When you do this, you're not a doormat, I promise you. Because if you choose to not be your own vindicator, how many of the Lord will be your vindicator? How many of the Lord will take care of you? And this is really important. Because people have taught, and I'm closing right here, people have taught serving from this place of subservience and lack of self-worth. I'm not talking about that. Do you think that Jesus felt any less like God when He washed the disciples' feet? No, no. He knew who He was the whole time. So I'm not asking you to diminish your value or your worth as you serve others in love. I'm asking you to serve as a king. I'm asking you to serve as a son of God, a daughter of God, and see what happens to the world around you. And people will be drawn to you. Because here's the thing. Everybody wants to be loved. Yes, they do. They're hungry for it. Real love. Not that fake stuff, man. I'm talking about real love. Amen? So, anyway. That's all we got today. So, Father, I, just, I thank You and praise You that You help us to love and that You help us to bring forth this fruit. Lord, we yield to You. Spirit of God, I think You're teaching all of us how to do that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Alright. Well, if you need to give an all up this morning, lift your hand up. We'll get one to you. Those of you watching online, you can give. Go to gracepointgeorgetown.com. Uh, thank you for giving. You know, giving into the place where you're fed, it, there's a tremendous blessing on giving in the place where you're fed. And uh, it's, uh, it's honoring God. It's honoring what God's doing. And there's a blessing on that for you. And we are grateful uh, for you supporting what we're doing. We're growing. We're increasing. We're going to be breaking ground. We're excited about it. Uh, we're feeding all kinds of people. You know, we fed, good Lord, we, we, sir, I can't eat, how many, we had five times eight, uh, how many pack? I don't know. We fed like 80 people at the, um, at the outreach last Monday, and uh, it was awesome, and we had so many people out there, and, and then we hit the streets, we took the RV out, and we went um, into, the, into the rough parts of Georgetown, and we fed kids playing basketball and handed out drinks and I mean it's just powerful but you know that's that's a, a part of that's y'all's giving man y'all giving into that we're buying this food and stuff and we're taking it out there and the next time we do an outreach we're looking to increase the food even more how many of people are hungry how many of people need help and how many of we want to help them amen and so when you're giving uh, not only are you giving to the things that are happening here at the church man but you're giving into outreach and and different things that we're doing, man. And I'm just excited about being a blessing and, and just helping people, man. So, Father, we just thank you. We ask you to bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, cool. Well, I guess we're going to eat. And then, uh, yep. Oh, sorry. I think you said my name. So, we'll, we'll bring the little people down. And... Uh,